Well, hey, friends, welcome back to the teaching and preaching ministry of Mohican Church. I'm Pastor Paul, and so glad you could tune in again today. So this is the last Sunday in the series uh, that we've been working on this summer. It's the ancients were commended, right? So it's a, it's a series that uh, has looked at these men of faith. Uh, we, we read about them in Hebrews chapter 11. It says that they were commended for their faith, which goes on to say that without that faith, it's impossible to please God. And so we've been taking a look at that, uh, focusing on some individual lives, as, uh, as you may recall, but, but truly the hero through this whole thing, the hero in every one of these stories has been God Almighty. He is again today, a little spoiler alert, uh, God Almighty is, the, spo is the, uh, the hero in this text too, as we take a look Back again in the book of Daniel, we were in Daniel 3 last week, going to be in Daniel chapter 6 today. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Daniel 6, and before we dive into that, let's have a word of prayer. Father, it is so good to be able to gather uh, once again in your presence, Lord, to be able to come through Jesus Christ, our Lord, boldly and with confidence before your throne. God, I'm grateful to know that you know us, uh, grateful to know, God, that you hear us. So thankful, Lord, that whatever it is that we have going on in our lives at the time that, that we're sitting down to a message about your great power and the faith of your children, then God, we just pray that whatever it is that's going on, that we would look to you with eyes of faith. Father, that we might trust you to work in ways that we cannot see and and Lord, that we might be willing to wait upon you. Father, we confess that, uh, that we would be much more comfortable if you just kept us from all the scary situations in life. But in truth, you don't do that. Uh, your son promised that in this world we will have trouble. And, and Father, we, we just acknowledge that. We acknowledge uh, Christ. Uh, warning about that, but we also acknowledge that, Lord, just in our practice. We, we have seen some challenges, nothing like uh, the story, that, the account that we're about to read, but uh, God, we thank you that sometimes you have delivered us from uh, the danger, sometimes you have delivered us through the danger, but you are faithful always, and God, we give you praise. So now as we open your word today, we do pray that you would teach us Lord, I pray that you would anoint uh, these lips as I speak, that I might speak your word clearly. And Father, I pray that you would anoint our ears as we hear your word spoken again. Uh, God, we thank you. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for the, the faith that we have found in Christ Jesus, for the life that we have found in him, and God, the hope that you have given us through Jesus Christ. We pray all this in his name. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, uh, you can go ahead and turn to Daniel 6. I just want to reference chapter 1 in the book of Daniel for just a little bit. So it's because that's where we're introduced to Daniel. Uh, he was one of the Hebrew boys who was brought uh, into captivity in Babylon. You may recall that he was uh, one of the group was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He was, he was part of those uh, who were carried off into captivity in Babylon. And he was described as a young man. And so it's important, by the way, for us to understand that part. He would have likely been in his teens when he was taken off into captivity. At that time, he was described as being amongst a group of men who was without physical defect, and was handsome. He had aptitude for every kind of learning. He was well-informed. He was quick to understand. He was able to teach Babylonian language and literature. So, I mean, uh, this guy had skills, right? He was not, uh, he, was, he was probably not... Um, well, somebody who, who didn't pay attention in class, I mean, he's, he's a good kid, he's a quick learner. He was graced by God then, uh, 
beyond that, he was given the ability by God uh, for knowledge and understanding, able to understand dreams and visions. And what we notice in young Daniel, in addition to all of those things, we notice in young Daniel, chapter 1, verse 8, that Daniel resolved to remain undefiled during his time in Babylon. And, uh, you know, I know I shared perhaps last week, I know I did in the, in the live presentation of the sermon, but, uh, you know, it's so important to know before you get in a situation how you're going to respond. You know, make those decisions ahead of time so that when that you get put in that spot that, that you've already got your answer uh, in mind. Well, Daniel already had his answer in mind when he's, uh, I'm guessing, you know, did he formulate that uh, even as he was being carried off to Babylon? I don't know, but at some point, Daniel resolved not to be defiled uh, by, the, by the, the sin stains of Babylon, if you will. And so that's what we read about young Daniel again in his teens. Uh, and, you know, full of idealism, full of idealism. Do you remember uh, how idealistic you were as a teenager? And so we see young Daniel as, as one of those guys. I mean, he's quick, he's sharp, he is set. He knows how he's going to live, how he's going to act, how he's going to respond. That's young Daniel. Well, when we get into chapter 6 today, though, we, we actually are, are taking a look at old Daniel. And, man, I hate to even use that phrase because, well, for one thing, I'm getting closer to the age that Daniel was. I still got a ways to go, but... I have a feeling it's going to go in the blink of an eye. So I hate to say old Daniel and young Daniel, but uh, Daniel, by the time we get to Daniel chapter 6, Daniel is in his 80s, which I do realize that by today's standards, 80 is not that old. But he's in his 80s, low to mid 80s. Um, he's not this young I idealistic man, and so... You know, I, I think it's going to be interesting as we take a look into Daniel chapter 6. Uh, do you suppose he's lost that idealism of his youth? Well, we're going to find out, in fact, that he didn't. You may know how this works out. You may not. But, but we're going to see something in Daniel that is like, okay, so as a teen, he had revo resolved to remain undefiled, and he apparently... From everything we can see in the scriptures, he apparently kept that resolve throughout his life. And so now he's an old guy. And, uh, and just watch how he responds to, uh, to our, the, the account that we're looking into today. Daniel chapter 6. It pleased Darius. So Darius is king now. Uh, Daniel has, he is old enough now. He has seen kings come and go during the, the 70 years of captivity in Babylon. So, Darius is king. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. Now the satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself amongst the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and was neither corrupt nor negligent. And so finally, these men says, we're never going to find any basis for charge against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. And, and so as we open this up and we get into these first few verses, uh, we're noticing that, well, as we saw last week with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as we saw last week, you know, jealousy rears its ugly head. As in the case, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were some of the captives. They were being raised up by God's grace to places of authority in Babylon. 
again, so that, you know, God had a purpose, he had a work, and uh, a purpose in them being hauled off into captivity. He had a purpose for their lives even there in captivity. God was, uh, God was orchestrating this situation. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were raised up to, uh, to places of authority, and they were hated for it. And if you recall, the Chaldeans wanted them out of position. In fact, they wanted them dead. Well, we see the same kind of thing going on for Daniel here in chapter 6. Uh, Daniel, he's one of three administrators in Babylon. He is entrusted to keep the king from suffering loss. And so they were scrutinizing this guy. I mean, it's kind of like, well, as I'm preaching this, we're back uh, in election season, right? We're, we're back into that. And so you'll see... Uh, you'll see folks just trying to slander, trying to destroy someone's good name uh, or reveal someone's uh, genuinely bad name, whichever the case might be. But you see a lot of that going on. I mean, just picking through somebody's past with a fine tooth comb. I mean, just running over every little detail. Well, they did that with Daniel. Uh, these, uh, these, these folks came out against him and, and here's what's really interesting. This was his own, uh, this was his own uh, colleagues, if you will. Um, we're going to see that in just a moment. But in their digging, in their searching through Daniel's life, they, they found no work-related grounds for charges. So they looked at the way that he did his business. Uh, they looked at a way that he was conducting his affairs as far as under the, you know, under the king's authority. And they found nothing, absolutely nothing. And while wouldn't that be a beautiful, uh, wouldn't that be a beautiful uh, reputation to chase after? If you're looking for a goal, uh, you know, you want to honor God. This is a really great goal. Take a look into Daniel's life. And we'll talk some more about that in a little bit. But that reputation, you know, the book of Proverbs says that a good name is to be treasured above great riches. And uh, which is probably why when I was a kid, when, when I was a kid, my dad always used to tell us boys, apparently when we'd get a little sideways in our thinking, he would say to us, he says, now boys, I worked really hard for the Bartholomew name in this community. Don't you screw it up. Pretty sure that he was going back to the Proverbs and the reminder that he had experienced the truth that a good name truly is to be treasured above great riches. Daniel had a good name. I mean, he lived his life for that kind of name. No work-related grounds for any charges against him. And, and in fact, uh, Daniel was such a man of integrity. Again, integrity is soundness of character through and through, right? Right? So wherever you slice Daniel, Daniel was coming up legit. He was solid. He was authentic. He was a man of character through and through. Uh, there were, they found him neither corrupt nor negligent. And I, you know, you can say, well, I mean, that's just good. He's, he's a God follower. He, he made this resolve when he was a young man, and here he is in his 80s, and, and he is still seeking to honor God with his life. Yeah, but how beautiful is it? So, so, of course, there's no corruption because he wants to honor the Lord. Not even negligent. Not even negligent. So, I mean, it's hard for me to imagine seeing Daniel with his attitude. It's like, yeah, whatever, that's good enough. It's Friday, let's get out of here. I can't see him doing that. Why? Because he was neither corrupt nor negligent. That's something to chase after. Something to chase after. In addition to Daniel's faith, you know, this, this man of God who truly did want to remain faithful unto death that he might have the crown that is eternal life. Well, so, so Daniel, uh, he's, he's one of these three uh, administrators, but, but here's what's interesting. If you look in the text, if you look in the text, verse 4 at this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against him. He was one of three administrators. The other two, 
uh, the way it sounds, the other two are conspiring against him uh, with his subordinates to, uh, to try to discredit him, to try to make him look bad. Uh, so, and, and here's what's beautiful, because maybe you've had that happen. Maybe you've lived, uh, and perhaps you're in, or maybe you've lived through a situation where, where your own, your equals, or your subordinates were trying to make you look bad. And we have no reason to believe, church, that Daniel stooped to their level. We have no reason to believe that Daniel just got down there in the mud with them. He just kept being faithfully God's servant. He just kept his eyes on God, kept doing his thing, knowing that God was his shield, God was his defender, God was his deliverer. The, the scriptures tell us um, that the name of the Lord is a strong tower to which the righteous run and they are saved. And Daniel understood. He's like, no, you know what? My trust is in the name of the Lord. So even when his equals and his subordinates teamed up together to make him look bad. He's like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not stupid to that. So they were in before the king in verses 6 through 9. The administrators and the satraps, they went as a group to the king and they said, King Darius, live forever. The royal administrators, the prefects, the satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed. Well, I don't think they all agreed, by the way, because Daniel wouldn't have agreed to this. And he was a royal administrator. Well, anyway... Uh, they've all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or man during the next 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, O king, issue the decree, put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. And, and so King Darius put the decree in writing. And so these other administrators and the satraps, they have laid this trap for Daniel. Take a look at Daniel's response, verses 10 through 12. When Daniel had learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened up toward Jerusalem. And three times a day, he got down on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and they found Daniel praying and asking God for help. And so they went to the king and they spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that anyone, or that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any God or man except to you, O king, would be thrown into the lion's den? And the king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the laws of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Note Daniel's steadfastness. And I so, <coughs> excuse me, I so love his steadfastness. His immediate response. You know, because this is where, again, we talk about integrity. We talk about character. This, there was no wishy-washy here. There was no... Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand up for God and I'm going to look really strong and sound really strong. But the moment that things get hard, I'm, I'm caving. The moment things get difficult, I'm going to waffle. The moment I feel threatened, then I, I, I just, you know, then I'm just going to go underground, right? Daniel didn't do that. His first response was not to organize a march nor to, to put together a petition. Uh, he, he wasn't whining on social media he hadn't called the news stations and said, hey, listen, this is unfair. We're being mistreated. He simply went back to his room and prayed toward Jerusalem. As we see King Solomon, as we see David in the Psalms, as we see King Solomon uh, when he was at the dedication of the temple, 1 Kings chapter 8, and he is, he is speaking about uh, oft times throughout this prayer that when they turn to you, the city that has been established for the glory of your name, when they pray toward Jerusalem. Well, anyhow, uh, Daniel simply went back to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem three times a day, got on his knees and prayed giving thanks to God just as he had done before. 
this, this steadfastness. See, to Daniel, to Daniel, you know, who, who went back when he heard about this decree, went back to, his up, to that upper room, if you will, with the windows open toward Jerusalem from his usual place, three times a day, Daniel prayed. He prayed. It, that time of communion with the Father was, was so rich and so ingrained into him. And I will tell you that you, and you can see this demonstrated by the faith that Daniel exhibited and by the life that he lived. This was not a matter of, now I lay me down to sleep uh, kind of thing. Or, you know, his prayer, it wasn't some, some you know, three-line prayer that he had memorized as a two-year-old. This was his prayer practice going to prayer regular basis he understood that apart from God he could do nothing he understood that that indeed when the storms come you go to that rock you go to that rock and that's exactly what he did this wasn't his first time there uh, certainly he went back as was his usual custom to his usual pray place cried out to God for help, but also uh, with prayers of thanksgiving. Prayers of thanksgiving. That the God who had sustained him thus far, he was quite confident that the God, that God was going to sustain him still. Now, when we see Daniel going back up to this place of prayer, I, I do think that this is of note. I, um, one of the commentaries, and I honestly don't remember which one it was. One of the commentaries mentioned, though, that this would not, uh, th Daniel's prayer, uh, it appears to be out of a pure heart. I mean, his going back in his regular uh, place at his regular time, as he had always done. That, that prayer time, it appears to be out of a pure heart. He he was praying out of obedience to God. He was not praying out of defiance to the king. You know, it wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a thumbing his nose at the king. It was, it was just, no, this is, this is out of obedience to God. This is that the God in God is his life. He knew that. He understood that. And so his prayer, uh, I believe with all my heart, was out of a pure heart pure motivation. Uh, this wasn't, again, it wasn't spite. This was his usual custom. What do you do when you're in trouble, Daniel? I pray. What do you do when things are going great, Daniel? I pray. What do you do when, uh, you know, just life is kind of uh, vanilla? What do you do? I pray. That's what he did. That's what he did because he understood that his lifeline was this privilege that we have in prayer. And I, and I have to wonder, do I, do I have that same sincere desire and longing and passion to be alone with the Father? I'm, I'm, I'm challenged by Daniel here. I just am. I'm convicted when I read about his commitment to prayer. Especially when in a time like this, he's like, well, you know what? I, I do know that the king gave this decree. But I also know that I must obey God rather than man. That, that, that when the commands of man are in direct violation to the commands of God, then I must obey God rather than men. We saw Peter and John doing that in Acts chapter 5 as well. And we, and we see that here in Daniel. So again, it wasn't spite. It wasn't, oh yeah, what are you going to do about it? It was just simply a matter of, well, this is what I'm going to do. Much like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had heard the decree uh, in, in what, that we read about in Daniel chapter 3. And they're like, well, uh, okay, but, but we have a higher authority than you and your commands come clearly into conflict with the higher authority who is the almighty God. We have to obey him first. So, anyway, so we see that. Look down in verses 13 then. And so they go back and, and he goes back to pray. The, 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 his critics go back to the king. And hey, didn't you say? Well, yeah, so look verse 13. They said to the king, well, Daniel 
One of the exiles from Judah, he pays no attention to you, O king, or to the decree that you put in writing, and he is still praying three times a day. He's, he pays no attention to you. He pays no attention. Notice how it says, so, hey, so Daniel, one of the exiles, really? I mean, after 70 years, after 70 years, hey, have you ever noticed how the enemy often tries to drag you back to who you used to be? You know, he's to, the, Satan, the enemy of our souls, he's described in Revelation 12, 10 as, as the accuser of the brethren. And wow, he is an accuser, isn't he? Well, but after 70 years of, of Daniel being in Babylon, they're like, oh, so this is Daniel, he's one of the exiles. And like, like King, in case you forgot, this one that you had made administrator, this one that you were, entrust, or that you were about to entrust the entire kingdom to, according to whatever verse that was, um, verse 3, you're about to entrust the entire kingdom to, to one of the exiles, King, just in case you forgot. I mean, it, I'm not trying to tell you what to do. Oh, King, live forever. But he's an exile, and he's not bowing down to you. He, ref, you know, he refuses to listen to you, to pray to you. He's still praying three times a day. King, just, just want to point that out. And so chapter six or verse 16, I'm sorry, verse 14. So the king heard this and he was greatly distressed and he was determined to rescue Daniel. Interesting, isn't it? He was determined to rescue Daniel and he made every effort until sundown to save him. And then the men went back to him. The men went back to him as a group and they said, remember, O king, According to the laws of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. In other words, king, ain't no way out of this. So they've gone back. Imagine their gall. Imagine their nerve. They're going back to the king first. You know, if it wasn't brave enough to, the, to say to the king, hey, this Daniel, he's one of the exiles. Have you forgotten? And now they're going back to the king and saying, hey, king, have you forgotten the laws, according to the laws of the Medes and Persians, any decree, any edict that you make cannot be annulled? And, and so the king gave the order, verse 16, and they brought Daniel and they threw him into the lion's den. And the king said to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. He's cast into th to the lion's den. This Daniel, this, this 80-something guy, probably doesn't bounce quite like he used to, but he's, he's thrown into the den of lions, just as promise. Even though the king was grieved to see it, the king felt like his hands were bound, and so, so Daniel's thrown into the lion's den. And then, and then the king makes an interesting admission here when he says, may your God... So, so the king makes no mistake that he says that, that Daniel, he serves some kind of God. That's not my God. And so Daniel may your God, whom you serve continually, may he rescue you. Whom you serve continually, your God, whom you serve continually. Are, are, we, are we catching this? I, it's a simple phrase. It's repeated here in just a few minutes, but, but it's a simple phrase. This God whom you serve continually. I love it. This is key to everything that we read about Daniel. It's key to his, his resolve that we saw in chapter 1. It's key to the life that he is living right now. This is key to the fact that he has... Uh, that he has lived as a man of integrity from his teen years when we were first introduced to him to well into his 80s, this is key. He served God continually. It wasn't, his relationship with God wasn't something like sometimes ours might be. Well, I kind of just check out. It's like I'm going off the reservation here for a little while, and, but if I get scared, then I'm going to run to God. If, uh, if my kids rebel, I'm going to run to God. If things get really hard at work, I'm going to run to God. If I get 
a, a really bad report from the doctors or even a little bit of a scare, maybe a loved one dies, then I'm going to run back to God. Uh, listen, friends, that, that lifestyle, that, um, that model of a relationship with God, which is really, if you think about it, only using God, that model of a relationship with God, that, that's going to leave an individual so incredibly vulnerable. Daniel, we're told, was a guy who served God continually. I, I would so love that. You ever stop and think about, you know, when you die, what might be on your, your epitaph if they were still into putting epitaphs on tombstones? Wouldn't that be a great one? He served God continually. I, I can't imagine, I can't imagine anything that I'd rather have uh, written up or said about me when I'm gone. I mean, if it could be said authentically, if it could be said in truth. We, we have it here in regards to Daniel. He served God continually. Everything else that we read about Daniel, his character, his nature, the, you know, the kind of person he was, the life that he lives, his steadfastness all came back to that. He served God continually. And, and I mean, and even the prayer life was part of that. So Daniel is thrown into the lion's den. May your God be able to rescue you. Verse 17, a stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Well, then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him and he could not sleep, which really supports the idea that he was looking for a way to rescue Daniel and which says something about Again, the kind of man that Daniel was and the way that God had shown Daniel favor in the king's eyes. Well, anyway, kings not sleep in verses 19 and 20. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. And when he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Has your God been able to rescue you? I'll tell you what. Uh, what, I, what I want to encourage you to do, just grab a pen right now. Just jot down Isaiah 40. Because I, I want you to be reminded about the God whom we serve. I want you to be reminded about, about the God who loves, who watches over, who does not neglect, uh, does not... Uh, 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 what is the word? Um, my, our cause has not been disregarded by the Lord. Isaiah 40. In fact, it, then it goes on to speak about, you know, characteristic of and promise to the lives of those who put their hope in him. Um, anyway, read Isaiah 40 when you get a chance. It just came to my mind as we're reading, you know, we're reading when the king cries out and says, has your God, whom you serve, continually been able to rescue you? Oh, he is a great God. If you were to look into Psalm 145, and there are other places where we see the power of God, the power of the one who stretches out the heavens like a tent is the God whom we serve. And he is able. He is able. Verses 21 uh, through 23, Daniel answered, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions, and they have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done anything wrong before you, O king. In other words, Daniel said, hey, listen, I am innocent of the charges that were, were leveled against me in this matter. I've not, I have not sinned against you. So, so Daniel was delivered without a wound, the scripture says. He came forth from the den of lions. Guys, what a mighty God we serve. I mean, truly, when I read these texts, I, I can't help but think, it's like, 
It, it stretches my faith. When I read these accounts about what God can do, and then I think about the things that I'm asking him to do, and, and, and even the greatest things in my imagination are well within the power of the Almighty God. Are you praying big? I mean, looking to God. The scriptures say some things that we never received from God because we didn't ask. I want to ask. I want to ask. In his wisdom, he will determine which ones are going to be good for me and bring glory to him. But I don't want to miss out on something because I didn't ask. God delivered Daniel from the lion's den without a wound. He says it was the, you know, God sent his angel. Was that the same one that appeared to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Was that also uh, an appearance of the pre-incarnate Christ? I mean, we don't know. We don't know, very possibly. But God sent his angel and delivered. Verse 24, at the king's command then, oh, I'm sorry. Verse 23 the king was overjoyed. He gave orders for Daniel to be lifted up out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. It's important to note, by the way, that his salvation, if you will, his rescue, his deliverance had everything to do with his faith in a mighty God, had nothing to do with Daniel's strength, with his toughness, with his, you know, he didn't have to like dig deep and whatever how we think we're going to get ourselves out of messes, he trusted in God, and God delivered him. Verse 24, so at the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in, and they were thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and children. By the way, that's pretty typical Persian judgment. It's brutal, it's over the top, that's the Persian people, right? Right? And, and so it's not uncommon. The wives and children, they go to, thrown into the lion's den. And, you know, guys, note the hunger of the lions here because, remember Daniel says, no, uh, God shut the lion's mouths. The angel that God sent shut the lion's mouth. There are those who would say, well, uh, you know what, those, those animals, they were toothless or whatever. They, they couldn't have been any harm. There are skeptics, critics who have said, well, uh, no, they were already well fed when Daniel arrived uh, in the pit that night. So, so that's why they didn't touch Daniel. Trying to excuse away the miracle of God shutting the mouths of the lions. But look what happened. Verse 24, when, the, when Daniel's accusers and their wives and their children were uh, thrown into the den, it says before they reached the floor of the den. Before they reached the floor of the den. The lions overpowered them and crushed them all. Pretty graphic, pretty gross. Daniel was rescued by a mighty God and, and those who accused him, uh, they suffered great harm. Well, so verses 25 to 28 and we wrap this up. King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, men of every language throughout the land and said, may you prosper greatly. So here's my decree, he says. Verse 26. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God. He endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end he rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. And so Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. <clears throat> and so we, we see the, the power of God at work here in Daniel's life. First in rescuing him from the lion's den, but... But also we see the power of God that in prospering Daniel. The power of God at work through the life of a faithful witness. It, it, really, it really gets me wondering when we see that here is this king who is like, oh, is your God, is your God going to be able to rescue you? We, we see the power of God working through the life of a faithful witness. One who had resolved to be undefiled even as a teen and 
and then well through, throughout his life and well into his 80s, remaining faithful, unwavering, we see the power of God at work in his life and, and, and we see then King Darius saying, hey, hold on, listen. Check out Daniel's God. Don't just check him out. You look to him, you revere him uh, because he rescues, he saves, he performs signs and wonders. Uh, friends, I can't help but think, you know, the scripture tells us when, we look, when I think about the power of, of a faithful witness, then I'm mindful of the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says, hey, you're going to receive power. Christ follower, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. And you will be my witnesses. You've heard me say it before that that's actually a reference to one who is willing to die for his faith. That's where we get the word martyr, the Greek word that's used there, uh, that's translated witness in Acts 1.8. That's where we get the English word martyr. You'll be my witnesses. Daniel was willing, being faithful unto death, that he might receive the crown of life. Will we be found faithful? Father God, we do pray toward that end. God, that there would be no shadow of turning in us, that we would be unwavering, that we, Lord, would be fully committed, faithful to the end. So help us, God. We cannot do this alone. We, we understand that. and we, we hear the promise of the Holy Spirit making us able. And so, God, we just look to you. Make us able. Uh, God, find us faithful to surrender to, to your will to your work. Give us a holy boldness and a courage, Father, truly, indeed, once again, putting on the full armor that you have equipped us with, that when the day of evil comes, we may be able to stand as did Daniel. And through it all, that your name might be glorified throughout the land. We pray this through Christ our Redeemer. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in today. Yeah, next week, we're going to start a whole new series. Uh, so join us back where you found this message. And, uh, and, and we're going to be embarking in another. It's, it's all part of discipleship. It's all part of walking then in the way of Christ. So look forward to catching you again. Love you like crazy. Thank you so much for tuning in today.